down on payers' ears. Mr. LaMalfa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. How's it going? The dam, here it comes. Are you braced for it? I'm braced. All right, good. We'll need some new answers, too. So two years ago, you spoke on the House floor, and you had a really good statement about uh, two of the bills that uh, we'd passed to streamlining construction of hydroelectric projects and two dams that affect Montana and Idaho, citing a serious disconnect between D.C. and rural residents. I'll quote you, while unelected bureaucrats sit in their offices in comfortable government jobs, residents are stuck in limbo, not knowing if good-paying jobs will come through or if they'll receive some relief in energy prices. So last year I sent you a letter asking your agency to reverse the misguided previous Obama administration campaign to ensure that regulatory conditions forced removal of the Klamath dams, three of them in my district, one on the Oregon side, which have provided flood control, recreation, access to affordable, reliable, renewable electricity that there's so many mandates for now these days. Also included uh, dozens of letters from my constituents in, in Siskiyou County who would still like to be heard on this issue and basically have been insulted by your bag man up there, Alan Mickelson, who's been up there at least six plus times insulting the people that oppose dam removal and listening only to the ones that want to remove the dams. That's how it seems and feels for them up there. So, you would have heard the pleas of these families, who have seen the disregard that the predecessor to your job has treated my constituents for the crime of being rural residents. You learn the hopes of these parents that they continue farming and ranching and living in a community where they have an economic opportunity would continue to go on. During this time of this administration, Congress has passed 15 plus Congressional Review Act legislation pieces in order to downsize the unfair regulations that have been dumped on resources, on agriculture, on many things that have hurt the economy in this country, country under the previous administration. A 22 to 1 ratio, at least for a while, of rescinding versus new regulations have come into place. Now, when we're talking about the, the Klamath dams up here, Interior has played a critical role in the decisions relating previously to the, the Klamath removal. Two years ago, your predecessor included the agencies as signatory to the KHSA with the explicit, pur explicit purpose of dam removal. You can withdraw that, sir. Your predecessor submitted a secretarial statement of support for dam removal to FERC, the agency that we need to get relicensing from for these dams to continue to operate, declaring Interior's policy to support removal of dams directed under the admitted KHSA. You can withdraw that. I've asked you to do so. These actions were taken before the agency ever completed the process to determine the impacts of dam removal and done in a way to completely avoid the public process, indeed secret meetings where we were excluded, my office was excluded, to set up a shell corporation so the liability would no longer be on the federal government or anybody else except for the shell corporation which will disappear after the dams are removed. And that also removes legal remedies opponents have they can use under a, a normal secretarial de de determination process because there's not even been a completed NEPA to determine what the impacts of the dam removal and the 20 million cubic yards of sediment going down this river to supposedly help this river and help coho salmon and other species recover. So I have several questions I would still like to take a shot at with you at a different time here today, the Ides of March, two-year anniversary of your previous statement. Will you allow a NEPA process to be completed before a decision is made? Will you withdraw the signature that you sent, that previous agency members sent to FERC so that they'll have a true picture of what is going on up there on the environmental impacts, the economic impacts, and the 79% of my constituents in Dis Siskiyou County that voted against removal, as well as the 72% that voted against removal on the Klamath side. Mr. Secretary, will you take these things into account and do as, as I have asked you before? I certainly, I'm committed to work with you on it. Here's the issue. We've looked at it bow and stern. 
Interior doesn't have a role, and I can't speak to the last Interior has had a role, sir, up to this point. Now right. you'll say, yeah, you've passed it off to FERC. Yes, these are private dams. These are not private dams when you have $250 million of state money as well as $200 million of, of ratepayer money and government action that has forced them out of business. All right, I, I will need... seek to have a further conversation. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I'll need you to maybe answer him in writing if possible. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before my clock starts, I have a parliamentary inquiry. Um, did the documents that Mr. Grijalva asked to be entered in the record, were they entered in the record? I didn't, I didn't hear the... No one objected. Okay. Are you Thank objecting? You. No, no, okay, no, no. I don't want to be redundant. If you're objecting, we won't be no. added. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, good afternoon, uh, Secretary Zinke. You're a veteran. I'm a veteran. Um, I don't think you need to be a veteran to respect and appreciate the sacrifices that veterans have made. Uh, we often hear and we say uh, frequently that we owe veterans a debt of gratitude that we'll never be able to fully repay. Uh, I believe that that uh, extends beyond the veterans, but also includes uh, family members, spouses, children, and even grandchildren of our service members as those who, to whom we uh, owe a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude. Uh, veterans often use public lands uh, as a way to find, find renewed purpose uh, and a place of refuge and solitude. Um, and uh, I want to ask you about your testimony in the Senate uh, because I know that you are a, uh, a veteran. I thank you for that service perhaps an opportunity to rehabilitate uh, what seemed to be a very troubling statement uh, that you made regarding uh, emission fees at our national parks uh, and the need to raise fees uh, due to disabled veterans being able to visit them for free because you said, and I quote, when you give discounted rates to the elderly veterans and the disabled and do it by the car load, not a whole lot of people actually pay at our front door. And again, I find this statement troubling are, oh, it's are, true. You know, it, are, it, it, it so is let true. me ask you the question then. Are you going to um, make disabled veterans pay for access to public no, lands? No, and let me, and I appreciate the question. Yeah, I'm trying to give you an opportunity uh, to rehabilitate here because that yeah, sounds no, like it you're was, going to pay for deferred maintenance no. on the backs of veterans of the disabled no, and the elderly. No, I have no intention of, of changing the policy on such things, yeah, but I've worked a lot of kiosks. Mm. And it's amazing to me about how many people come through that don't pay because well, it's let me been ask the, you this, been the then, policy that, that... Let me ask you this, if yeah. I may. How many visitors do we have to our national parks every year? About 330 million visitors a year. Come about how many parks. come uh, are in, in cars? Uh, most. Most. And how many of those visitors are veterans? Uh, we don't track. Okay, how many of them are military mode. members or, or dependents? Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't track. Okay, how many of them are disabled or elderly Americans? We don't track, uh, we, we don't track who's in the car. Okay, so I'm, just, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very concerned can, then, then when I hear that they come in by the car loads, but we don't keep track of the car loads, yet in your testimony to the Senate regarding whether or not well, the fees at the parks are sufficient. I think you should go to the- If I'll, I may, you suggested that it was because of disabled veterans, elderly, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so I'm just really concerned, particularly where you don't well, have- if you let me answer, I'll talk to you. Uh, well, I, just, I mean, I, I asked you some specific okay. questions. Do you know the number of veterans? And you said no. We, we track the number of, of when, they, when you buy a card, uh, you know, a, a, a year card, we track that. We don't track, as long as a person has a car, we don't record who is in it. But I've been, and I, I'll invite you to a kiosk uh, with me and go through. Presently, our policy, and I don't intend to change it because I, I'm, I'm comfortable with the policy. Okay, then I'm it's, fine. It's, then. It's, it's I'm, I'm fine. Thank you for answering the question. No, I, I'm, I'm fine. I do appreciate uh, that you won't change the policy. Uh, on the fees uh, for uh, our uh, veterans. Um, let me ask uh, another question, if I may, shifting uh, focus. Uh, your budget includes a 15% decrease uh, for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's Renewable Energy Program, which is about a 1% 1 1 higher decrease uh, than your overall budget um, from the 2017 funding levels. Uh, earlier this week before the Senate, you stated that budget cuts for renewable energy programs are driven by expected demand. 
Are you anticipating a 15% decrease in national demand for offshore renewable energy resources in fiscal year 2019 compared to 2017? And if so, what criteria are you using to determine those projections? Uh, our budget analysis, both onshore and offshore, is consistent. Uh, we, and we budgeted towards expected demand. There are n numerous projects that are, that are leased, or we have several leases off the East Coast. Generally, when you have a lease, you're talking about a three-year project completion. California is looking at 330,000 acres uh, of federal land. That has to, has to go through a NEPA, but our budget is consistent with, the, with our expected demand in this, in this fiscal year. Would you expect to decrease? Uh, well, we, our, our, it's, it's, it's matched to the demand, and I'll show you the same data. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Westerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Zinke, for being here today. It's always good to, uh, to see you, and I know I, I didn't see the Senate meeting you had the other day, but I heard that the senators were uh, very interested in how you got from point A to point B and um, seem to be infatuated with that. I wish they would have hearings and talk about policy and issues that we've tried to push through on the House. But on the, on the travel side of it, I was glad to see you uh, show up to work the first day on a horse. I thought that was uh, um, made a good statement about um, you and about our national parks and the, the Department of Interior. So uh, I give you a thumbs up on that one. You were talking about um, forestry a little bit earlier, and I, I want to talk about forestry, but really in the vein of, of water. Um, we know that the states that seem to have the, the biggest water problems also have some of the worst managed forests, the least healthy forests out there. We've heard testimony in this committee that in California there are more uh, the forest is dying at a faster rate than it's, it's growing. We certainly saw the, uh, the catastrophic wildfires out there last year. I was uh, in Arizona recently. I, saw, uh, I heard about the big water issues, and I saw a lot of poorly managed forest in Arizona. And you know, the story goes on in that uh, forest and, and water uh, issues. But uh, scientifically, we know that forests play a very important part, not only in water quality, but in water quantity. And as you consider water issues, and is, is your team putting an emphasis on the interactions of, of forestry and water? And also, are you working with Secretary Purdue and his staff in this area? Well, we are. And, and, and on travel, you know, what people don't talk about is the last administration spent over a million dollars, 80 trips on charter flights, and I do three, and I have 12 time zones, uh, about a fifth of the territory of the United States, and in every case they're reviewed by ethics, in every case they're reviewed by legal, and there was no other alternative. So it's amazing that no questions were asked, and I looked at Sally Jules, and I think she was actually appropriate. So when she took a charter flight uh, and went on a hike, I didn't go on any hikes, but I can tell you she was right because that's the job of the Department of Interior. So I, I appreciate your comments. Forestry, we're consistent with policy. Uh, I think we're probably leading uh, in my secretary order to look at mechanical extraction, prescribed burns, and me, be more aggressive on, on our holdings. It would be helpful if we had category exclusions uh, to take bigger chunks out uh, to make sure we can restore the health, and we've talked about that. But the condition of our forests countrywide, nationwide, um, it now has resulted in death. Was last year, just in Santa Barbara you know, County, uh, dozens uh, perished because we have too much dead and dying timber in the fuel load. And maybe this last forest season, uh, maybe this country and our political leadership will take pause and maybe understand that the present policy we have uh, is causing great harm. And I'm optimistic because it, it, it happens on both sides of the aisle. Uh, <clears throat> shifting gears a little bit to infrastructure, I know there's the, the huge maintenance backlog that you talked about. Uh, in my district, actually in my hometown of Hot Springs National Park, uh, we've used uh, his, uh, historical leases 
of old bathhouses uh, to a great effect, and the park's been able to uh, take these bathhouses off the maintenance backlog and attract and have new attractions there. Um, you, you get a little bit of income from the lease, plus you don't have that maintenance expense anymore. Um, and with your emphasis on maintenance backlog, have you encouraged other parks to creatively use historic leasing and other private and public opportunities to further impact those investments? And with that, I want to personally invite you to uh, Hot Springs so I can show you the great job that's happening there in the bathhouses. You know, we are looking at appropriate public-private partnerships uh, across the board. You know, our rangers don't flip burgers now. They never have. So lodging, a lot of our transportation, interior, food is, is vendored out. Not everything uh, should go public-private partnership, but we're encouraged there's been some innovation, and we're trying to, to look at across the board to give the superintendents more flexibility uh, to enter public-private partnerships, looking at longer-term contracts to incentivize investment, uh, and there, there's a number of things that we, I think we can do within the park system especially uh, to incentivize investment. Uh, again, there's, there's appropriate you. things and there's not appropriate things. Thank you. Mr. Gallego. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Secretary Zinke, uh, just number one, I want to echo um, what the uh, Congressman from Maryland said in regards to our veterans uh, and any uh, decisions that are being made I think should be done uh, in a manner after a thorough study. Uh, but let's move on and talk just uh, briefly about the monument review. Uh, I know uh, Interior undertook a very good and long public uh, comment process where more than 2.8 million Americans shared their opinions uh, on the monument review. So tell me, is it true that approximately 99% of those comments you received were in favor of maintaining our national monuments? I'd have to check the statistic for you, but what I can say is we have 150 monuments. The president asked me to look at 27. Secretary, I can you just answer that question first? Part. My question is, what, what do you understand? Was it overwhelmingly supporting uh, of keeping the monument process or not? If you can't give me the exact number, what do you know? Uh, I can give you the number of congressmen, senators, state legislature, and governors in the state of Utah. That Secretary, I'm specifically did. asking with the public process. I will have to get the numbers for you. So you don't even know anecdotally whether it was favorable or not? I'll have to get the numbers for you. Okay, so you took an under you undertook a review process, and for some reason, off the top of the head, you can't remember what the public commented on there for for essentially changing a very very established law. I do know specifically of the elected officials. I'm not asking you that, Utah, Secretary. That represent the state of Utah. Secretary, I'm not asking you that. I'm asking a very simple question. You are the Secretary of the Interior. You took a public comment period to review the national monuments. I would hate to mislead you and give you a false number. Okay, you don't have to give me a false number. number. What is their overall impression? Anecdotally, were more people favorable or not favorable? Simple answer. I'd hate to give you those numbers uh, without giving them specifics, but I'll certainly give the ex okay, exact moving on. specifics. So your recommendation to the president was to reduce the number of existing monuments. Um, let's just skip to this. How many meetings with industry representatives did you take before making your monuments recommendation? Roughly the number. The process for monument review was going out and visiting every state, which by the way, I was criticized to take a helicopter. I don't know how you look at two million acres on an aerial survey right, without doing Mr. it. Mr. Secretary, I wasn't the person that's actually criticizing on the helicopter, so stick to the question here. And your question is what, sir? How many industry representatives did you take meetings, did you take meetings with? In regards to the in monuments? In, yes, monument review. We looked at uh, all sides of the issue. I had public meetings in multiple locations at every monument, which all sides were represented. I didn't, I didn't I, we made sure that all sides were represented. Okay. From what I understand, the answer is 180. I would like to see the number of, of people that represented the other side too. I'm sure it's comparable. Okay. I'm How many sure meetings did you hold numbers. with the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition? Pardon me? How many meetings did you hold with the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition? I met them in Washington, D.C. I met them there. I met them over the phone and had individual meetings. So the actual coalition sounds like you had one meeting then, one face-to-face. -face that would be meeting. incorrect. Uh, I had a meeting there. 
I had you a meeting there being in, in the Utah. office. I met Begay. So I would say multiple meetings with either the coalition itself or parts of it to include also the Navajo Nation in the state of Utah, the only elected official that represents by Congress a district of the Navajo, uh, that would be Commissioner uh, Benelli. Okay, so what would you say the number is then? You have to take a guess. Even, even giving you some sway on the uh, number of in your question, meetings with the tribal, people there in the tribal council are involved with the tribal council. I had a meeting there with the with the coalition. I had a meeting in Utah with such as Zinke. I'm asking you just a number. I, I know you're a Navy SEAL and math might be difficult, but you know, give me a rough number here. Rough number of what is specifically your question, and I take offense about your derogatory comment about the United States Navy SEALs. <laughs> of course, having not served, I understand you probably don't know. Having not served? Uh, not in the Navy and not in the Navy SEALs. <laughs> all right, Mr. Secretary Zinke, I apologize, but as you know, we have uh, uh jokes all the time as a Marine and as a grunt. And of course, I appreciate your service. Semper Fi. Semper Fi, brother. Now, you do have a, a, a problem that you can't answer my question in terms of numbers. Give me a rough estimate here. Uh, no, Russ has to know what. <laughs> how, many, uh, how, many, how many times that yes. I met with the coalition? Yeah. Yeah, I met with the coalition as a whole uh, once there. I met with multiple members in my office. I met with multiple members uh, in, the, in the field. So as a group, probably as an entirety group, probably once there. But I met with multiple members in my office multiple times and had phone conversations with them. Thank you. That's well Mr. documented. Graves. Thank you. I yield back. Semper Fi. Semper Fi. <laughs> Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, pleasure to have you back in the committee again. Uh, appreciate you. appreciate you being here. Uh, General Bergman's offered to, to give you your seat back anytime you want it. So uh, Always a pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, uh, first, I, I, I want to thank you for uh, the, the change in the, in the budget request for this year related to the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act. And you and I had a number of discussions about that. Um, uh, as you know, the Obama administration for two years tried to cut that revenue sharing program out, and uh, we had some uh, challenges last year, but, uh, but I do want to tell you that, that I do appreciate you taking a fresh look at it. You agreed to do that last year, and I appreciate the change in the budget request this year, and I know that millions of people in South Louisiana do as well. So uh, first, I, I want to say a very big thank you for that. Second of all, um, I appreciate you coming down to South Louisiana. A lot of times people, I think, get stuck in their, in their bubbles or, um, or in their cubicles, and in your case, you get a little, a little bit bigger in a cubicle, but, uh, uh, but people get stuck in Washington and, and I think lose the perspective of what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, the investments in the case of Louisiana through offshore energy revenue sharing and other programs, I think, are yielding significant benefits, not just to South Louisiana, but to the nation in terms of the ecological productivity, the improved resilience, and the fact that you came out, we went in an airboat, you stood on some of the new ground that we created in South Louisiana, and I think made a multi-billion dollar commitment to, to us on a video, if I remember right. Um, that was impressive. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, you and I have discussed in the past this, this disparity that occurs. Uh, when you produce energy on federal lands, you get, uh, that state gets 50% of the money. Or in the case of Alaska, in some cases, 90% of the money. Uh, you have revenue sharing programs uh, related to, to wind and renewable energy. You have the timber revenue sharing program. Uh, it, it happens all the way across the board. But when you look in reality for the offshore revenue sharing, and, and I'm going to take a pretty wild guess, but, but revenue sharing, when you look at the total amount of money produced versus the revenue we'll share in for this year, my guess is it's probably around one or two percent. How do I explain to people at home the disparity in, in revenue sharing for onshore production that's 50 percent or even 90 percent with an additional 40 percent uh, going into the reclamation fund in the case of, of offshore Louisiana, which contributes a significant amount to our nation's uh, energy independence or energy dominance when we get such a small fraction of a percentage of overall, overall revenue sharing? Well, I, again, I, I appreciate your hosting me down there, and I, I want to make sure your coastline remains a working coast and not a disappearing coast. 
uh, I was amazed that a football field of material is lost every hour. Uh, if you're referring to the LWCF uh, or the reorganization, is that the reorganization does not affect current programs. It doesn't affect uh, the reorganization, I'm sorry, the, the infrastructure bill that's proposed in the budget, the largest investment in public lands in the history of this country as far as infrastructure goes, is uh, the model we have is net dollars into Treasury. So it doesn't affect Go Mesa, it doesn't affect LWCF. If those, if those percentages are adjusted by Congress, uh, then there's still net dollars going into Treasury. The proposal would be half of that at a level would go back into an infrastructure account to pay for our parks. So if, if the LWCF or Go Mesa is adjusted, it would not affect the net dollars going back in. Uh, Mr. Secretary, do, do, you, do you understand, so as you know, LWCF is funded from, from offshore our coast. Uh, Louisiana produces 80 to 90% of all the offshore energy production in federal waters. Uh, if, if LWCF monies go out, if, if you're gonna take funds for uh, backlog maintenance issues, all that's coming from offshore our coast and the very area where this, these funds are derived from is not sustainable. And so it's very difficult for us to explain to people at home, it's difficult for us to defend, and quite frankly, I won't defend, uh, efforts to try and take these monies and put them into other states, into other areas, when this very area that, that, that's really the golden goose for revenue for your department is, uh, is unsustainable itself. We need to first sustain that area well, uh, to your point, uh, the infrastructure uh, proposal were, were, that we proposed is all energy. Quite frankly, it's onshore, offshore, wind, solar, all energy produced on federal land, regardless of, of type. Great, thank you. It, it does not affect any current program. Thank you. Ms. Berrigan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to start by associating myself with the comments of my colleagues um, from California opposing your proposal to open up our coastline to additional oil and gas drilling. Um, this would be disastrous for the coastal economy and public health. 69% of Californians strongly oppose new oil and gas drilling off our coast. Um, I wanted to make sure to reiterate the importance of this issue and our opposition on the record. Um, as somebody who has fought to uh, prevent oil drilling off the California coastline. It's also very personal for me, so I wanted to make sure to also express um, my opposition. I hope, Mr. Te Mr. Secretary, that you will give fair and due consideration to our concerns and the importance of California's coastline and its tourism to our economy when you are uh, making decisions. Uh, and I'll relate really, the same thing that I, when I talked to the Governor Brown, is it was my decision uh, to put everything on so America could see its potential, uh, almost zero-based budgeting, and then talking to, I've talked to every governor, I've talked to most congressmen about it, and then we're gonna shape the plan to make sure it reflects the interests of the communities and Thank the Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I only have about three minutes left and I wanna shift gears a little bit. Um, I appreciate that. Um, first, I also, I wanna thank the ranking member, Grijalva, for bringing up the issue of the Department of Interior being a good steward of taxpayer dollars. Um, this also is something that I have um, been doing over the course of my career. Uh, Mr. Secretary, last October, I led a letter, um, which I'm holding up here, along with my friend, Mr. Beyer, um, that was signed by 24 other members of Congress, including ranking member Grijalva and nine other members of this committee. It's dated October 3rd, 2017. It asked you to immediately disclose the full details of all of the privately chartered flights that you had taken. Mr. Chairman, I want to start by asking unanimous consent to enter the letter into the record. And you should look at um, what we've I'm, I'm provided sorry, I'm to. I'm sorry, Mr. Secretary. If, if you let, let me just okay. finish. Um, yes, without objection. Thank you. Um, so the letter that was written to you was as a result of reporting by the Washington Post Politico and numerous other sources. The reports included a $12,000 charter flight from Las Vegas, Nevada to Montana, taken last June aboard a plane owned by executives of a Wyoming-based oil and gas exploration firm. 
part of an industry whose permitting process you are tasked with overseeing. Now, these flights can give the appearance that you are mixing political gatherings and personal destinations with official business. You know, as the letter points out, these privately chartered flights appear to coincide with events held by political donors and speeches before private entities that share a personal connection with you. Um, again, this letter was sent on October the 3rd. Neither I nor Mr. Beyer have yet received a response. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's just a yes or no question. Can I get a commitment from you that you will respond and provide information that we requested in the letter? Well, I can't speak for your ranking member, but I hold a note in response from me that's dated October 31st, 2017. So I would suggest you ask your ranking member to give you a copy of the letter okay. we sent. Mr. Secretary, and if you like, you, if you you like your, more detail on it, we also had a meeting Mr. which Secretary, I had with a ranking, to, ranking. Mr. Secretary, yeah. you used to be a member of Congress yourself. When you wrote a letter to a cabinet secretary, did you not expect the cabinet secretary to respond to your letter? October 31st. Is that letter to me? Is that responding to my letter, Mr. It is Secretary? To the ranking member and to the chairman of this okay, committee. Okay, I, I think you made as my well point, as Mr. I had Secretary. a member, I opened a meeting. I reclaim my time, Mr. Secretary. I'm not done with my line of questioning, and you know, I just very nicely am trying to get a response to to my letter that's directed at me. You know, I have a different office than the ranking member does. Um, and I, the reason I bring this up is because this is a pattern that's impossible to ignore, one that has the optics of the steward of our public lands allowing the concerns of political donors and the oil and gas industry to receive f further greater influence than those of the American people. And ex excessive spending, whether it's on this or a door, can I get a commitment that when I send you a letter, Mr. Secretary, you will respond to me in a timely manner to me as the member who wrote the letter? I would love to give you a commitment, and I wish you would give a commitment to me of courtesy, because I, I answered the letter. Not only did I not answer, not only did I answer the letter, but I also had a minority meeting, which I invited every member of the minority to sit down and talk line by line on any issue you had. And as far as a oil and gas concern, it's contracted by the Department of Interior, blind of origin, and if a company owns a contracted King Air, then we don't look at who owns it because we go through a government contracting service and that's exactly what occurred. So to give an allegation that somehow we favor King Airs traveling at night after traveling all day across from Barump, Nevada would be inappropriate. The uh, chair would ask the uh, unanimous consent that the secretary's response also uh, be included in the record. Mr. Uh, uh, pardon, Ms. Cheney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, Mr. Secretary, I hope that you will put Wyoming down on your list as a yes. We in Wyoming uh, fully understand and recognize that our fossil fuels are are in fact national treasures crucial to the functioning of our economy. And, and I look forward to my colleagues from those states that have been so insistent on taking time for political purposes and on denying the value of fossil fuels to trying to run their state economies without fossil fuels. I think that would be a, an interesting challenge for them. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I've got just, just three issues I might want to list um, and then get you to, to see what we can do to help us on, on all three of those. Um, while we in Wyoming have been uh, very grateful and pleased with um, the, the permitting improvements, the improvements in the permitting process, uh, as you know, the technology in some instances has really outstripped uh, the regulatory framework. And so when you have a situation as we do in, in Wyoming where you've got split estates, you've got private ownership of the surface and federal ownership of the minerals, we're still facing significant challenges. And um, really need some clarification and some relief with respect to what, what is the role of the BLM in particular when the uh, land is, is privately owned and the, the minerals are federal, especially in situations where we've got horizontal drilling now that's reaching out um, miles and miles. The second issue I wanted to, to get your assistance and help on, Mr. Secretary, has to do with view sheds. Um, there was a, a memorandum issued at the end of the Obama administration that dealt in particular uh, with Section 106, tribal consultation, again, on private lands. 
um, and the National Historic Preservation Act, and, and we need some clarification in this regard as well. Um, we need a new instructional memo. We need some clarity for BLM field offices with respect to um, how they can properly conduct tribal consultations without um, the kind of very significant delay that, that we continue to see and, and what seems to be uncertainty. Uh, and then finally, Mr. Secretary, in the area of water, um, we've got issues between the Bighorn Lake, uh, which is in Wyoming, as you know, and the Bighorn River. Uh, and um, the Bureau of Reclamation seems to be um, imposing uh, some rules and regulations with respect to water levels in the lake, water levels in the river um, that aren't balanced. And we really need a return to balance and, and would very much appreciate your support and your help in terms of making sure we don't have a situation where my constituents uh, in places like Lovell, who depend very much upon recreation in Bighorn Lake, uh, are faced with, with levels of the lake that are inconsistent with the BOR regulations, um, but that are somehow focused on uh, the needs of the river. We just we need some balance there, and I'd very much appreciate your taking a look at that issue as well and, and letting us know what we can do uh, to ensure that those communities and, and the economies there that are so reliant on recreation in the lake um, aren't infringed upon. I agree. I uh, committed to work with you on. I was unaware of the Bighorn uh, issue, but we'll, we'll we'll look at it. In general, our regulatory framework, uh, the government is always behind innovation, and we're trying to look at a framework of regulation where we make sure there's a threshold for safety, reliability, stewardship, but to incorporate innovation, best science, and best practices. It is clear with horizontal drilling and some of the innovation on, on wind and solar as well that our regulatory framework is not capable of keeping pace with industry innovation. And in many ways, innovation improves reliability and safety. So we are working with energy and innovation across the board to look at giving some flexibility without diminishing our core responsibility of stewardship and environmental safety. On permitting, which is always a problem, uh, we're catching up. We're also looking at there's a state permitting process and a federal permitting process. And we're, we're looking at within the confines of the law, how do we make sure we're not redundant? And so giving the, the front end to the state, having them do what they need to do, and then us doing the, just the tail end, rather than, than the federal government repeating the process uh, line by line. The other thing that's not in taking place in permitting is if you're in the basin and you have 16 wells, for instance, same basin, same geology, starting the permitting process of a new well as if it's the only well you've ever, dr you ever drilled in the basin uh, is, is a problem because it repeats things that are not necessary and it takes the resources away from us looking at basins that are not commonly drilled that need a closer look. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming before the hearing. I have a few questions, but I want to go back before I do that to understand for myself what had taken place in the question and answer between you and Ranking Member Grijalva. I'm, I'm trying to understand that. Uh, in, I, I, to me, I, in, the, in the, the USGS North Slope Oil Assessment, I don't think there's any question or any belief that you made any changes in that. I think you respond, you know, felt like you had, no one is saying that. We assume that you made no changes at all and that you just had the report. The question, though, I think the underlying question is, why did you request to see the USGS study before it was released? As I understand in the, uh, the manual, USGS manual, it says, particularly sensitive results, however, such as energy and mineral resource assessments and mineral com commodity reports that typically have significant economic implications are not disclosed or shared in advance of public release because pre-release in these cases could result in unfair advantage or the perception of unfair advantage. So my question is, why did you do that? Not 
that you did anything changing anything, but why did you request to see it when in fact it was the policy not to share with anyone the USGS report because of the possible market implications? Well, first of all, there's a chain of command and the USGS works for the Department of Interior. So I have every right to look at and review documents prior to release from the Department of Interior. Same would be your staff. Uh, your staff works for you. I assume you look at releases prior to your staff's re releasing. The question is integrity of documents. And in the case of scientific documents, I, don't, I didn't change a, com a comment, and to your no, point, I didn't. Did. But this is what I wanted to know in the, in the case of this one, and I, I think you'll be interested to know. You had the same data set, two studies within a couple years of each other, and the outcomes were different in magnitude. So why was there such a difference in magnitude? Was it because Bohm also looked at it, and Bohm has a better uh, modeling of resources? And when it says recoverable resources, is that modern technology using hydro, uh, hydraulic fracturing, or was it standard, and did it include offshore? Those are the questions, because it makes a difference uh, as interior policy about, about the National Petroleum Reserve. That's why I looked at it. Okay, let me, let me go on, because I don't have a great deal of time, and I understand that. But what I don't understand is that when you say you're looking at the methodology, the first study was released in 2010, and then we're talking about what happened in the fall of 2017, now we're in 2018, so it was almost eight years ago. And there have been a number of major oil discoveries have been made in the region covered by this assessment. So I don't think there's any mystery uh, that the resources have jumped. It's not the methodology. We know that the resources have jumped. So the question is, even though you're asking about questioning the methodology, I don't think that, and I'd like to hear your answer, is the critical issue. We all know that the resources, so I'm, the question is, were you not aware of the discoveries over the past few years, and that was the reason for the change? The data set was largely unchanged, because uh, we've done really, no, in the areas, we haven't done a lot of seismic in, in, in a, a review of it, but that's the question I asked, and I'm a geologist. And, it, and when you have one study that's done a few years and the next study is done, uh, BOEM comes in and the magnitude of resources is significant. And then I want to know at what level did we look at recoverable assets because it's important. Are we looking at technology seven years ago, five years ago, today? Yeah, I think those are fair questions and also the extent because you have horizontal drilling now that has a reach even a few years ago, we couldn't go. So again, as Department of Interior, as a secretary, I have every right to, to look at documents. Like you, I'm concerned that if you were manipulate the documents, I think there's an integrity problem because we all, all respect the scientific integrity of the, of the people, and that's what we if want I, to preserve. If I might just change the topic just quickly and oh, just ask one more seconds. question. Uh, no, no I'm, your, your time's up, Mr. I oh, yield back. Sorry. Uh, the Secretary's already given us uh, 45 minutes more than we had requested. Uh, he's been very generous. We uh, understand that he does have a hard stop at 1 o'clock, uh, so members can do the math uh, as far as the time remaining, Mr. Heiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Secretary Zinke, thank you for being here today. Um, we miss you around here, uh, but recognize that your leadership was desperately needed at Interior, and we're very grateful for what you've already accomplished. Um, I recently read that the nat natural gas and oil industry supports about 10.3 million jobs nationwide, staggering number. Um, in Georgia, we face some natural factors of navigating offshore development due to the migratory patterns of the right well. So to begin with, in your opinion, um, as good stewards of our land and uh, oceans and so forth, do you believe that we can strike a balance between protecting our ocean environments and at the same time developing natural resources that provide not only jobs but financial um, opportunity and national security? I absolutely do. And I think our oil 
gas, wind, and above American energy policy is correct. It is better to produce energy in this country with reasonable regulation than watch it get produced overseas with no regulation. Secondly, morally, I don't want to see your kids see what I've seen in battle, ever. I don't want to be held hostage by foreign entities of our energy needs, and I don't want to see your kids have to deploy and fight overseas for our energy we have here. Lastly, economically, every time America pulls up to a gas pump, we talk about the tax bill, how wonderful it was, and it is. But every time you pull up to a, to a gas pump and you're paying $60 rather than, rather than $100 for a tank, that's $40 America has in their pockets to, to just spend elsewhere and they need because American energy is producing. So yes, I'm pro-energy and interior has two sides. We have the energy side because we have offshore BLM property. We also have the conservation side, which is our parks and our public lands and our treasures. Uh, yes, you can do it wisely because American industry has shown you can. Um, let me jump to this third question that I had real quickly uh, regarding preservation of, of our battlefields. Uh, we recently uh, were, we were able to protect Battle uh, Kettle Creek, uh, which was a very important uh, place for the Revolutionary War in that battle. Um, and I believe these are very important uh, to preserve. So I would be interested to know if you have any ideas to improve the, um, uh, the, the American Battlefield Protection Program, and I would like to be able to work with you uh, in that regard, but want to know if you have any plans. Uh, well, our infrastructure uh, bill that we have submitted in support that's in the budget addresses $11.7 billion of that, of that. That includes our battlefields, to restore the landscape as it was when the battle began. Our, our battlefields are challenged. We have a lot of people going through them. The preservation and uh, maintenance of the battlefields, we don't charge in many of the battlefields. Uh, we don't certainly charge in Gettysburg and most of them, which is appropriate because they're America's uh, look into a very difficult period in our, in our, in our history. But the infrastructure bill that we're proposing uh, looks at specifically battlefields, parks, wildlife refuges, and making sure that we are stewards of our greatest treasures to include the battlefields. We have some ideas and we'd love to work with you on that and throw, throw some of those ideas your way. Uh, lastly, I, I just want to know, um, going back to my constituents, how can I ensure them that the department will not be uh, in the same mess we're in now of 16 billion? What, what assurance can we give them that uh, we're not going to repeat this process all over again? Well, I would think there are certain issues that are not Republican or Democrat, Democrat, and I would like to think that public lands and our parks are red, white, and blue. I think we all care for them. And there's been proposals to make this a longer term, but I, I think up front, you know, is if we work together and we pass an infrastructure bill, again, it's, it's new money, we will be in a good position to preserve our, our, our parks into the future and our public lands. It should be a bipartisan effort, and I'm hoping it, it is. Thank you, I yield that. Great, thank you, Mr. Gomez. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Zinke, thank you for being here, Secretary, um, and going a lot longer. A um, few questions, um, and I'm going to try to go quick because I know there, I have colleagues on the other side that want to ask some questions. Uh, you've said numerous times that the reason behind the department's cuts on renewable energy programs is due to the expected demand. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. We looked at expected demand both onshore and offshore okay. of what uh, it can be put in bare yeah. during this thing, and our budget reflects that. And I'll give you the numbers if you, okay. if you want them and, no, why, and a, how we dri drive them. Okay, thank you. Um, so next question. In President Trump's fiscal 2019 budget request, he proposes an increase in funding for oil, gas, and coal, and coal programs. Does the President's request also reflect the expected demand for those resources? Uh, some of the budget has to do with backlog of permits, uh, which is in there, uh, and, and opportunities. But yes, it reflects, and I, I'll give you the background on that. Uh, coal is up $9 million uh, with that. 
And I'll, I'll give you a okay. breakdown of everything in that package. Okay, no, I, I appreciate it. Just because what I'm trying to understand is what's the logic behind the administration's projections because the coal budget of the Bureau of Land Management has increased by 80%. However, um, according to Bloomberg and other sources, the coal production in the United States is going through a downward trend even under President Trump. And just can you explain that discrepancy? Well, coal has leasing, permitting, and inspections on it. And some of the energy also is on the inspection side uh, of our offshore leases, because you have to send people out there to inspect. And so you look at across the board and, and improving safety and reliability. Uh, so some of, the, some of the money is looking at, at how we can improve safety. No one wants an oil spill off the coast. And so we have to invest in it and make sure that we don't have that. And there are certain areas that the last administration, I think, did not focus on. Uh, we are focused on looking at innovation, best science, best practices to improve reliability and safety. And in some cases, it costs a little more, mm -hmm. but it's a better policy overall. Okay. No, no, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, because, you know, as you know, we've seen a downward trend on, on this. 2017, coal production was up over 2016. Uh, the pace of production in 2018 is 6% below 2017 and 21% below 2015. And you're explaining the 80% increase based on, on safety. Um, we also saw offshore leases, uh, lease sales were weak, um, bringing in the third lowest amount in the past 12 years, about one-fifth of the, the average. So we're going to see increase, significant increase in the oil, gas, and coal budgets um, partly reflected in demand, partly reflected on safety. Um, so what I'm trying to understand, and I guess I'm gonna answer my own question, there's, when it comes to renewables, demand is the critical um, factor in determining if the budget goes up or goes down. But when it comes to oil, gas, and coal, it's, it's other factors. So um, the reason I, why I would not characterize that way, but I would say the last administration, there's no doubt, and I don't give judgment, the last administration wanted a larger profile of, of renewables and put a budget in place to kickstart it. The, the, and that's clear. They did. The last administration it did that. Uh, we looked at expectation of, of demand and being large, the two, we had the largest lease sale of offshore oil and gas in the history of this country, in the Western and Eastern Gulf, just to run the, the leases yeah. and inspections is gonna take more. Well, I, I appreciate that um, elaboration. The, the reason why I'm curious, and the reason why I'm asking this, that the Bureau of Ocean Energy and Management also said that a cut would make stakeholder, like to, their, to the budgets of renewable energies would uh, make stakeholder meetings less effective, delay lease sales, harm increasing staff, and that there would be an impact on the demand of, of renewables. Um, you know, I think that looking at demand is a great way to look at it, and I support a balanced portfolio, but it needs to be honestly balanced. And right now, it definitely seems like one energy source is being um, promoted and given more funding the, than the other energy sources. So I yield back my time. I'm out of time anyways. Thank you so much. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for your service to the country in so many capacities. We appreciate you being here today. Time is short. Let me get right to it. I'm, as, as a Louisianian, I'm very grateful that the budget doesn't call for an outright elimination of GoMesa, uh, but it does threaten the security of this critical funding for Louisiana by way of the Public Lands Infrastructure Fund proposal. So look, I'm disheartened. All of us in the Gulf states are you know, yet again, members who represent regions most directly impacted by this proposal were included in the pertinent discussions. And all of us, it is, it is red, white, and blue issue. All of us want folks from around the globe to be able to enjoy our parks and wilderness areas, but refusing to stop the loss of land in my state means loss of property and ultimately loss of life. And uh, none of us should pretend that this shifting of revenues and resources can be justified. I mean, you gave a SEAL analogy in the beginning in your opening statement. To use that analogy, the Gulf Coast is our front line. We're talking about hurricane preparedness, flood risk mitigation, coastal restoration, all that's urgent. You acknowledged a few moments ago, you've, you've seen yourself, you noted that a football field of land is being lost every single hour. So 
In your testimony in the subsequent budget documents you provided this committee, you highlighted the significant contribution that oil and natural gas revenues generate. Onshore production, on the other hand, pales in comparison. So I just want us to be clear and, and honest today. I know you will be. The revenue for your fund is going to be coming from offshore to fund interior. And, and we shouldn't pretend that wind and solar are going to be picking up the check for the department's deferred maintenance. It's just not going to happen. So here's the question. You, you say that the infrastructure fund proposal will not affect Go Mesa funding at all. I think you've said or implied that today. But the problem is that the, the issues are with the baseline projections. We haven't been uh, given any numbers, specific numbers, uh, that were used to establish the baseline in the bills even as late as this afternoon. So how do you respond to that, that, that concern? Uh, the, the baseline, of course, it will require Congress. Our proposal had, if you go back to 2008, Interior made about $18 billion just in offshore, and thank you for that. Uh, when we took office, that number was about 2.6. So when you add onshore production, that was the baseline, and the proposal has what's called new energy. But to your point, you were exactly correct. It does not affect Go Mesa is net dollars going into Treasury. So Go Mesa, LWCF, and there are other states, shares, and all that is just net dollars going to Treasury. So if Congress changes the portfolios, the, the different, different types of, of programs from oil and gas, it would be whatever is left over net into Treasury. Half of that goes back to address our, our backlog and maintenance. Uh, we think uh, given projections that we can we can catch up in as much as eight years uh, with favorable conditions, but it's also all energy. It is different than LWCF or Go Mesa because we look at a trend, and we'll see on the March uh, leasing sale uh, what the level of interest is. Because as you know, drilling for oil off the coast has greater risk. The market tends to move towards less risk, higher returns. The shale plays in Texas, in New Mexico, in the Bakken still remain strong, as well as innovation in renewables. The East Coast is going gangbusters on renewables, and we are all the above. I support renewables, too. And I get that. I get that. I'm, I'm running out of time. The, the, Senator Alexander was quoted March 11th in a National Journal article saying that both the National Park Restoration Act and the National Park Service Legacy Act of 2017 should be considered in committee. Both pieces of that legislation would threaten Go Mesa funding as well. Do, do you agree with the senator that those bills ought to be considered? You know, like everything in Congress, everything should be on the table. I think uh, what the, what's in the, the president's budget, uh, given that I was a, I was a congressman, uh, Go Mesa is important to a lot of my friends and members, and that's why our proposal left those programs uh, in Congress intact. Uh, so it's just net dollars going to Treasury. So obviously I, I support the work of the, the president, and I support you know, having a dialogue and, and putting together a bill that addresses the maintenance and repair. Has the department considered alternative funding sources to pay off the deferred maintenance backlog, for example, the, the sale of federally held lands to some of the states? We have not. Uh, $11.7 billion, the criticism about park fees. Uh, Park entrance fees primarily, I think, should go to the parks that the entrance fees are at, and, they, and the superintendent should have more flexibility to address, you know, those issues in those parks. But, you know, the park fees itself will never address $11.7 billion in backlog. Thank you. And clearly Congress has had some challenges to do it. Thank you, Mr. Byer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Mr. Secretary. I'm still deeply concerned by the shooting death by the park police of 25-year-old Bijan Gaysar last November in Virginia. And you have the senseless tragedy. We only know about it because the Fairfax County Police also responded, and they had their car cameras. So I want to applaud the park police for the pilot program to begin deploying body cameras, and thank you for agreeing to brief our committee on how the department is updating its policing policies. Um, but I am concerned that there's no current set-aside for law enforcement to adopt body cameras or car dash cameras and no tech set aside. So we know if it's, it's not in the budget, it won't happen. So I'm just asking for your commitment to this committee that the department will prioritize funding beyond the pilot project for these cameras for our park police. You know, uh, we're looking at it, and I too, uh, of course, serious concerns. 
you know, I love law enforcement. I love the U.S. Park Police um, with them every day. They're wonderful people. There has to have some assurity among our citizens that the force is, is, has integrity, does the right thing all the time, because as you know, law enforcement is raised to a higher standard. We're looking at, we're looking at it. We have not made a decision. I want to see it on the basis of facts, but we're looking at, at different options along the way to increase transparency uh, and of our actions of the U.S. Park Police and BLM and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We have, we, have a, we have a lot of people with a badge out there. Yeah, let me go. You know, Mr. Secretary, wildlife trafficking is the fourth biggest organized criminal activity in the world. And it's linked to organized crime syndicates, terrorists, insurgent groups. And Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement is critical for combating illegal wildlife trade. Yet the administration's budget proposes a drastic reduction in funding for it, which reduce, decreased the number of special agents that work to stop domestic and international wildlife crimes, which brings me the recent announcements that the Fish and Wildlife Service will now allow elephant and lion trophies to be imported from certain African countries on a case-by-case -case basis. How do you reconcile this policy with President Trump's previous comments calling trophy hunting, quote, a horror show, and saying, quote, he didn't want elephants killed and stuffed and have the tusks brought back into this country? And I'm particularly curious about your assurance that you're 100% in step with the President's position and the White House stating that the President's thinking has not changed. Um, how I explain it is this, is the court, there was a lawsuit by NRA and a number of people, so the court looked at it, the court mandated that we change our process, but our policy has not changed. We are 100% aligned with the president's policy. We have imported zero uh, elephants, uh, and our policy has not changed, but our process reflects the court ruling. Yeah, great. Thank you. The proposed elimination of the Cooperative Endangered Species Fund is surprising, considering that you praised one of these grants during the Obama administration when you were part of us for a conservation easement to assist the Whitefish Lake Watershed Project in Montana. You said, quote, this grant is proof of what's possible when our delegation works together. Uh, do you stand by what you said in 2016 and why eliminate this program that seemed to work pretty well in Montana? And, and up front, the LWCF, as you know, is reduced in our budget primarily for land acquisitions. But we're, I'm focusing the grants right now on wildlife corridors and public access. Those we are reconfiguring because I, I signed a secretary order to identify and conserve wildlife corridors, starting with big game and going through, because as you know, as populations go up, our public lands gets challenged, and we have to make sure we connect things that are critical for in the future, watersheds, wildlife corridors. So we're looking at our grants to make sure public access uh, and conservation easements and identify, and, and our grants are going to focus a little while on, uh, as far as conservation, on, on protecting the critical pieces of land management watersheds in, in the Chesapeake, things going into it, and wildlife corridors. And I just want to thank you personally for your attention to the wildlife corridors. It, uh, there are many, many folks in the environmental movement who thinks that, who believe that preserving and creating these corridors may be the most important thing we've done in a generation. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gianforte. Secretary Zinke, thank you for being here, and thank you for your leadership. I very much appreciate that. Um, as a fellow Montanan, you know the, we watched with heartache this past summer as much of Montana burned, one, over 1 1.2 million acres. And I just wanted to start with a, a thank you. Uh, when the Lodgepole fire burned uh, over 27,000 um, acres, I really appreciated your timely response uh, to get the C.M. Russell Wildlife Refuge open for grazing our ranchers in Garfield County and the nearly 65,000 hungry cattle uh, also thank you. So I appreciate that. I think that was the fastest BLM moved perhaps in the history of the Bureau. It shows that government can work. And I, again, your leadership was critical. It would not have happened without your support. So thank you. Uh, I want to stay on wildfires. Uh, I know you visited a number of fires as I did. We were together at the Lolo fire this past summer. 
And I'm curious, as you've talked to incident commanders and first responders on these various wildfires, what lessons have you taken away that will allow us to better fight fire in the future? The lesson is the first element of prevention or, or making sure that fires don't happen is prevention. And there's too much dead and dying timber and the fuel load of our forest is too high. Everyone agrees that temperatures are higher, seasons longer, but what isn't helping is the amount of fuel load. And we need to go to an active management policy, which I've given a secretary order to address that. Uh, it would be helpful if Congress would give the secretaries, uh, both Sonny Perdue and myself, a category exclusion so we can look at addressing the millions of acres we are in behind on, on getting the fuel load out so we don't have the same problems year after year. And you and I have been in the same Bitterroot Valley probably for three seasons together. And every time we hear the same thing, what have you done between now and last fire? And the answer is we're thinking about removing some dead and dying trees. We almost have a timber sale. We almost have it. And then the next season, we're back there again, uh, you know, watching the people have to evacuate. And you're well aware we're tied up in endless litigation over these projects. We can't get endless. them approved. So uh, I have co-sponsored the Resilient Federal Forest Act along with Congressman Westerman. Uh, that has passed out of the House. Uh, have you reviewed that bill, and would that help us start to manage our forests better? Uh, when I was in the House, uh, I, I signed on to it too because I think it's a great bill. It's not perfect, but I can tell you it, it gets an A. Uh, because as you know, nothing's perfect in Congress, nothing's perfect in me. I wake up every, up every day, I have 70,000 employees, 12 time zones, a fifth of the territory of the United States. Something bad's gonna happen every day. But you know, a lot more good happens than bad. And I support you, Bill. I, I, I think it's absolutely needed. Uh, and a lot of it comes in in the execution of the bill. All of us can agree that we need healthier for us. And I'm hoping all of us agree one of the many ways to get there, remove the dead and dying timber and go to an active forest management policy. And there's other countries, quite frankly, we can learn from. Well, we'll continue to advance this Resilient Federal Forest Act. What additional action should Congress be taking to give your agency uh, better control to do better land management? I think category exclusion would be, would be helpful. I think on reviewing uh, probably the, the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, you know, there was an incident about doors that I had in the office. Well, it was 139. I, I was reading the article too. How could doors be $139,000? Uh, so I asked the question, we got it down to 75,000 by, by manipulating, but a lot of the issue is on historic buildings, you have to follow such stringent rules even though some of them don't make common sense, that it just costs the taxpayers to dollars and we're bound by those rules. I don't have any choice. Uh, so I think a little more flexibility where common sense uh, can be put in, and sometimes our, our rules, good intent, uh, but when you're bound by a law that doesn't make sense, this is where working together can be helpful. Um, good. And Mr. Secretary, thank you for your leadership, and uh, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I, I certainly appreciate waiting, you waiting for the, the new guy uh, to have just a minute with you. I, too, sat where you did. <laughs> right, right here. <laughs> thank you. And uh, let me just say personally, for anybody that's concerned about your use of tax dollars, I've seen you sit uh, on the back of an airplane with me in the lowest economy seat. And uh, somehow you folded up those legs of yours and got them in that, in that seat. So I hope the taxpayers appreciate that. I fly coach. I always have. Good, good, good. Um, also, a deep appreciation uh, from my district and from the state of Utah for your attention to our needs there, for the difficult decisions that you've made, um, and uh, much appreciation from my state. Let me just mention a couple of things briefly to you, and then I'll be done. Um, <clears throat> I was the mayor of my city of Provo, Utah for the last eight years. The very first year as mayor, the Central Utah Water Project came through my city. They put a 60-inch pipeline from one end of the city to the other end of the city. None of that water was delivered to our city. It went up further north. But we tolerated and embraced that project because we know how critical it is 
uh, to our valley and, and um, to the state of Utah. Now another uh, arm of that project is going in that will help Provo. There was a, a $2.4 million gap, not huge, between what was appropriated and what was in your budget. And just wanted to see if you would take a look at that and see if there's a possibility of closing that gap so we can finish this just critical project for our valley. Well, well, we funded $8 million. I know it was uh, about $2 million short. And it goes back to, I think what, what Congress can help me with is transfer authority because I'm holding books on a lot of projects that should be transferred over to the water districts themselves. Because again, the original intent on a lot of these projects was the small communities couldn't afford them. So we wanted to make sure the land was productive so the federal government would come in, invest in it, and over the period of time, the water users would pay it off and then title would be transferred at an appropriate time. We forgot about the title transfer at an appropriate time and thus, when you look at it now, years later, decades later, we are holding on to a lot of assets that we're paying for that we should transfer over to the water districts and then focus on building new projects and being a good neighbor once again. Would love to explore that uh, when we have more time uh, to see how I can be helpful with that. Thank you for, for your attention there. Uh, the second and last thing is I'm fortunate to be uh, have the district with the iconic Arches National Park unit. It's an amazing asset. Uh, the state of Utah every once in a while wonders if we did the right thing by advertising these parks. Uh, we're loving them to death. Uh, the lines are long to get in. And the current park supervisor has worked very hard uh, to try to come up with a plan and currently is looking at a reservation system in the park. It won't surprise you to know that that's causing some consternation in, in, in Moab. And it's simply an ask to um, help us all make sure that we're exhausting every possibility um, and that we're trying to accommodate as many visitors as that park can appropriately handle. Um, I, I learned just today that she was doing an economic development study, and that's really critical for that area to know what the impact would be of a reservation system. And then um, just the hope that we can continue to exhaust every possibility uh, before we move to that reservation system to make sure that's the right thing there. We certainly are looking at options. One of the options actually is going to a transporter on right. our, our maybe the top 10 parks. And a transporter is probably having Tesla or one of the zero emissions because people love those. Design a glacier park like a red bus uh, carrier where we begin to, to limit the number of cars and then tie it into an app. So if you, part of the problem with Zion has been is that if you have a bus system out there, they drop 70 people off at a trailhead. So your visitor experience is a clump of 70 people. So we're actually looking at an app system where you can tell whether a trail is red, yellow, or green to make sure the park experience that we all love is maintained. So we think that, that that model may work and we're evaluating what it means, but there's no doubt there's gonna be more visitors to our park than we had this year. Right. That we're loving our parks to death. We have to address the backlog and maintenance and repair, and there's a capacity that, that uh, is probably there, and we're at, or over capacity at some parks, but it's about people management and making sure the visitor experience is, is sacred. I think it would be fantastic if I can go back and tell the good people of Moab that we're looking at those types of uh, options and at least considering technology and uh, making that visitor experience um, valuable. There's, uh, of your deficit, there's about $25 million backlog in, in Arches. Um, and, and although fees can't overcome all of your deficit, that, that is one situation where you, you may have the ability to hit to, to come closer to that deficit if we could increase the number of people in that park. Knowing Moab, I can bet they're gonna like zero emissions. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right, yeah. Thank you very don't, much for your time. Don't ever say that again. <laughs> um, Steve, I gave you, Steve. Representative Curtis, <laughs> can you change your first name so you match the mayor? I want name, you're gonna, you're gonna owe me more time, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. You, you got the extra 30 seconds because you're from Utah. Thank you. All right. Um, Secretary Zinke, I appreciate you going above and beyond the call of duty here. I hope it is either from your background as a SEAL, which goes above and beyond the call of duty, 
or simply your background of having sat here and being cut off when the speaker leaves before you have a chance to ask any questions. But the fact that you spent this much time means something really significant. So I do want to thank you for just uh, putting up that much time, and because you stayed longer than you actually said you could stay. And that doesn't necessarily happen with a whole lot of other people who have, who have come to testify in front of us. So you know the drill here that uh, Committee Rule 3.0 says that any member who has additional questions has three days to send them. If they send them, submit them to us by the close of business.